Welcome back to the Weber Kettle Series brought to you by Fogo Charcoal here on Chud's Barbecue, everybody. My name is Bradley Robinson, and today we're cooking up an absolutely perfect brisket on the Weber Kettle. Him it up! This is a brisket! Had it dry. This is a USDA Prime brisket. Picked it up at my local HEB. And when you're looking for a brisket for your Weber kettle, you're not looking for the most gigantic brisket you can find because it does have to fit on the Weber after all, and space is limited. This one's about 17 pounds, but I can tell just by looking at it that this lean is really long compared to the point. So I know when I trim this, I can scoop it down and get it down to that perfect size. But in general, a 12 to 15 pounder is really what you're looking for. It'll cook quicker and it'll fit on the Weber without being too close to the fire. So to trim this up, I'm gonna start by by taking off all this hard deckle fat on the back here. Don't need that. It's not gonna render out. It wants to come out anyway. And it's great for making sausage or beef tallow. So I'm gonna trim this up like I usually do. Next up, we're gonna take some of this fat and silver skin off the backside. Just trying to make it look a little prettier. I'm also gonna take down this edge. It's pretty feathered and looking kind of nasty. So we're gonna shave that down as well. Don't want any sharp edges on there. They'll just kind of burn up and then they'll get crispy and they'll grab the serration of your blade when you're slicing this down the road. This is a weird looking brisket, but hey, pickings were slim at the grocery store today. We'll address the rest of this later. On this side, man, this is a long one. I'm gonna scoop out some of this fat where the point meets the flat. Don't need that. Then we're gonna take down this point muscle a little bit. We don't want this thing flapping around, burning up on us. Round off this backside. And then we'll start to take down this fat cap just so we've got about a quarter inch or so. And of course, all this fat and meat is very usable. Great for burgers, great for sausage, meatloaf, you name it. Chud scrape, looking good. Now we're gonna give this thing some shape. Take down this thin corner. Like I said, we're gonna shrink up the lean quite a bit on this one. You know, I'm thinking the lean should come to right about there. And there's also all this lean right back here that has got no fat on it. It's just gonna burn up, not gonna make for a good slice. And that's kind of the whole point of trimming a brisket is so every slice at the end of the day is completely usable. We don't have bits of meat that are already cooked and not gonna be good for slicing or eating because I'd rather have this in raw form where I can make tallow or burgers or something than a bunch of burned up meat at the end of the day. But hey, you do you. Just rounding this off, giving it some nice shape. And there we have it, a beautiful looking brisket. Nice and aerodynamic, nicely shaped. Not too much thin meat on this side, so it's not gonna pool up nearly as badly. Tapered edges, nice and aerodynamic. Perfect amount of fat on there. So I think it's time to season it up. For our rub today, I'm going on with the classic SPG. That's two parts 16 mesh black pepper, one part diamond crystal kosher salt, and one half part garlic. And we're just gonna go on nice and heavy all the way around. And don't forget the sides, folks. Come on, it's the best part. And this pepper heavy rub is really what's gonna give us a great head start to our bark. All that pepper is gonna help attract some smoke, add some lovely color to this thing. Ugh. And you could go on with the binder. A lot of people like to do that. And you know, if you're using something like mustard, if you ever cook mustard, it kind of turns into a paste. And that paste very well may be blocking salt penetration and smoke penetration into your meat. And I just don't think it's necessary. This rub sticks a-okay. Boom, looking good to me. Let's fire up the Weber. Going on with some more of these little post oak wood chunks. This is just a piece from my pile that I threw on the old chop saw for a bit. I'm gonna go right on top. Do a little extra in the beginning. So it's lit on this side, which means it's slowly gonna burn this way and it'll hit these logs along the way, giving us some smoke throughout the cook. But the majority of the smoke flavor that's gonna penetrate this brisket is gonna happen in the first few hours, which is why I'm doubling up on this side. But on we go. I'm gonna kind of plump this up a little bit using the natural curve of the brisket to hug this outer layer. In retrospect, I wish I had put the slow and sear on the other side so I could have the fatty side facing the fire, but I think we're gonna be all right because there's also a hot spot right on this lid where all the smoke is kind of turbulating. So on we go with our lid water pan is full got the vents over the meat that way we get optimal airflow and we've got this little thermometer down here to maintain temps just after a few minutes we are rocking a solid 275 on this weber kettle with some lovely smoke coming out and for the majority of this cook i'm going to aim to keep it between 250 and 300 degrees but i will keep you posted we are about seven hours into this here brisket cook and i gotta say it's looking pretty good got some nice bark on there starting to pool a little bit right there that's kind of weird 
but it has been known to happen before. But you can see right here, we're getting some really good fat render. We got that pillowy fat situation going. Very nice. That's what we're looking for. And I've been doing a few things to this brisket while it's been cooking. First of all, you may notice it is facing the other direction. About four hours in, I flipped it. So the fatty side is now closer to the fire to give this lean edge a bit of a break and start rendering all this fat. I can tell you right now, probably should have trimmed some more of that off. I've also been hitting it periodically with some apple cider vinegar just around the edges. You can tell on the ends right here, it's getting hit pretty hard and the points over here. So just trying to keep them moist so they don't burn up so much. And because it's such close proximity to the fire and there's so much radiant heat in here, keeping it spritzed is usually a good thing. Not usually necessary on my offset, but this is not an offset. As for wood chunks, still got this little guy right here. This is what they look like after a few hours. Once they turn all black like that, I've just been tossing them in. Boop. And our fire is pretty much dead at this point. We're down to about 200 degrees. After about five hours, I started going through and just periodically tossing in some more charcoal. You know, kind of running it like an offset, just throwing some big chunks in here and there. We'll do it right now. I must say though, it's been quite a pleasant cook. No big temp swings or anything like that. Very predictable. Had steady stream of smoke all the way through. You can tell the bark's looking pretty nice. And what I've been doing whenever I throw some new chunks on is I'll bust out the old mini leaf blower and I'll just give it a little bit of a head start, let it catch for a minute or two. That way when I close it, I know it's gonna actually light and stay lit instead of just kind of smoldering away. But yeah, it's been a pretty fun day. Easy cook, nothing to it. Just maintaining temps. The hottest it got was about 310, 315. And when that happens, just close the damper on the lid a little bit. By the way, the bottom vents are wide open. Rocking around 160. It's been there for a while. We are dead smack in the middle of the stall, which is something I usually never have to deal with on my offset, but this temperature hasn't raised in at least an hour. So I'm gonna bump this temp up a little bit, push through it, and then we'll wrap it up. <laughs> So I lost some footage of me wrapping that brisket up, but basically what happened is I kept it on the Weber until it came up to an internal temperature of about 175 degrees. Then I pulled it off and I wrapped it up with some Reynolds Kitchens pink butcher paper, as well as a nice healthy glug of some beef tallow, wrapped it up tight, and then I popped it into my oven. And that's the biggest benefit of wrapping in butcher paper is once it's wrapped up, it's really not gonna get all that much more smoke flavor on it because it's completely wrapped in paper. So all we're really after is some nice clean heat, and that means we don't have to run the Weber anymore. It's a great pro tip for beginners, especially those on the Weber kettle, because maintaining temps in an oven is a lot easier than on a Weber. So I popped it into my toaster oven at 250 degrees until the internal temperature came up to about 200, 205 degrees. Then I opened the lid and let it cool down. All right, y'all, I think it's time to see how this here brisket came out. So after letting this rest down from 205 degrees down to about 160 degrees, which took a surprisingly long time, about two and a half hours, probably because it's getting hot out here in Texas. This thing went into that toaster oven at 155 degrees and it's been sitting in there just like this for the last 12 hours. But now I think it's time to see how it came out. Ooh, smelling so good. And there we have it, folks. A beautiful looking brisket, that bark. Oh, looking real nice for something that came off a Weber kettle, I'll tell you that much. A little bit of fat came out into this pan, so oops, don't mind if I do. Give it that glisten factor. That's what the people want. Looking pretty good to me. Feeling nice and tender. Got that flop factor, soft bark. Ah, I think it's time to slice in. Ooh. Gotta say, folks, not too shabby for the old Weber kettle. Got a little bit of pooling right here. Edens are feeling a little crispier than my typical briskets. But hey, all briskets are different. This one was pretty weird. So I think it's time to slice on in. Beautiful looking lean, nice and drippy, nice and tinda. Beautiful smoke ring on there. It's crazy that you can get that much of a smoke ring with like three chunks of wood. Let's go for that burn end. Feeling very nice. And there's the beautiful fatty brisket glistening in the sun. Got our beautiful burn end slice right here, covered in bark, looking lovely. Incredibly tender, beautiful render on that. Gotta say folks, that Weber kettle impresses me every time. And this is way better than the briskets I used to cook on the Weber kettle back in the day. Beautiful burn ends. Let's get a couple slices of this fatty side, shall we? I mean, just look at that. Come on. And there's really just not that much to it. Beautiful slice of fatty brisket, so juicy. The ever popular bench test. You know, a little salt and pepper, a couple chunks of wood, spritz it here and there, maintain temps. That's really all you need to do. Get a couple of these lean slices, shall we? Ooh, that bark, it's got a stickiness to it. Not a bad looking slice of lean, folks. Beep. Uh, solid brisket, tell you what. Let's give this a taste real quick. Go for a little fatty brisket. One of the best bites right there, that little tip, all that smoke in there. 
Mm. Oh yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, that is lovely. Lovely. I mean, it's nice and smoky, nice and tender. Bark is there, it's not overly smoked. Wonderful intramuscular fat, perfect bark. It's everything you need. It's not nearly as smoky as my offset. This lean end is definitely a little on the dry side compared to what I usually cook, but you know what? If all you have is a Weber kettle, you can definitely turn out some really good brisket. Nothing wrong with that, folks. And like I was saying the other day, if you ever overcook one of these or mess it up too badly, Make yourself some perfect chopped beef sandwiches. These burn ends though, that's what life is really all about. Ooh, mm. oh, so fatty, so salty. Mm. Just goes to show you folks, you don't need a $4,000 smoker and a $200 Wagyu brisket to produce good results in the backyard. Granted, those things do help. You're gonna have a much easier time having consistent results on an offset. You know, you have less things to worry about because you're not cooking inside the cook chamber, but but all in all, if all you have is Weber kettle, then this is a great way to go about doing it. You know, it's not the best brisket I've ever cooked, you know, but you'd have to be like a barbecue professional to find the fault in this thing. Cause it's got it where it counts. It's salty, it's fatty, it's smoky, bark is there, it's tender, fat is rendered. All in all, this is a solid B plus brisket that I would gladly serve any of you. Speaking of which, I think it's time for the official taste test. <laughs> All right, John, that is it. That is how to make an absolutely fantastic brisket on the Weber kettle. Again, if you start with a quality brisket, a good trim, a simple but effective rub, a few chunks of wood, some quality charcoal, and just maintain your temps without any major spikes, you're gonna produce great results. And all the other tips, like the two different spritzes, the tallow wrap, the overnight rest, the fat on the fire, those are just bonuses that are gonna help ensure you get the results that you're after. But let it be known that the Weber kettle is a great little brisket cooker. But with all that said, if you enjoyed this video, let me know by hitting that subscribe button, let YouTube know by dropping a like on this video. Leave a comment down below letting me know what you want to see me cook next. If you do give this recipe a try for yourself, be sure to tag me on Instagram at Chud's Barbecue. I love to see what y'all are cooking. Big shout out to Fogo Charcoal. Thank you for sponsoring the Weber Kettle Series. And until the next time I see you, please go cook something outside. Peace.